biographical data shows that His Majesty grew up in foreign lands. Thus, when he consented to take upon himself the burden of kingship and the status as head of state, it could be the reason why His Majesty was intent on getting to know his subjects. Starting in 1954, dense jungles and mountain ridges and cliffs in the remotest parts of Thailand were the spots where the lord of the land and his entourage of mixed ages paid their repeated visits. His Majesty used to ask about the speed hill tribe people walked. Having obtained the answer, he would proceed at an ever-increasing speed. Distance and height not only added up on the time it took us to walk, they also took a heavy toll of the entourage's physical endurance. A sole high-ranking official could keep up with His Majesty, but then he looked up above him and fainted on the spot. His Majesty had to bend down to grab him. His name was Sitai. We then alternated between pulling him along and carrying him, all the way up to the top of the cliff. Some members of the entourage were gasping for breath, could not respond to radio calls, and they came that often too. A voice would inquire how the persons were getting along. Of course, only the sound of hard breathing was heard in response. His Majesty was having such a good time. At the initial stage, it seemed His Majesty's first visits to different parts of the country were for the purpose of site surveying, as well as first-hand data gathering to learn the nature of problems his subjects were facing. It could probably be regarded as an orientation to the ensuing royal-initiated projects. The visits enlightened His Majesty on the geographical features the people's living quality and the various problems facing the people in each part of the country. These problems vary distinctly. The most fun came when it was time to break for lunch, not at noon, but around 2 p.m. The road condition along the routes of His Majesty's visits, especially at the beginning of the rain, can be described as undeveloped. Up on high mountain tops, the only access is by air only. Many destination points were deep in the heart of the jungle, on high altitude. Many others could be assessed by dusty laterite roads infested with potholes. The condition did not bother us much, as we had experienced it before, but it was rough for local officials, like provincial governors and the like. I followed behind and could see how pale they looked sitting there. I mean, they did not faint. They were all sitting in rows when it came to walking up those hills. Everywhere he went, His Majesty would not fail to see calloused hands folded together high over the owner's heads, in respect to him. Some laid out the most precious piece of cloth they had on the ground, waiting for His Majesty to step on them. With the king's footprint on it, the piece of cloth would not be used or washed. Instead, it would be neatly folded and preserved at the praying spot where the people keep Buddha's image. On Sabbath day, they will put flowers to pay homage to the sacred piece of cloth in gratitude for what His Majesty has done for the country. Most of them do this. In highest esteem and with total devotion, people's heads bent down toward the young monarch's feet. This was believed to bring good things to their life of hardship. I was down on the ground to pay respect to His Majesty when he came down. He actually came directly to where I was sitting. I had never dreamed I could meet him in person. Tears readily rolled down my cheeks. I was overwhelmed to see him. As His Majesty walked past them, those expectant eyes lit up in stark contrast with the harsh and weather-beaten faces from hard work. Thus, the people's delight and smiling faces could not conceal the traces of sufferings from His Majesty's watchful eyes. The king knelt down to talk to us, asked how one of us who was blind could come. He said his niece brought him along. Why did you want to come, was the king's next question. His voice was so gentle and soft. How I love to hear his voice. He even embraced the old guy.